a welcome from the UK and the US and everywhere that you guys are hailing from all over the world. Um, we're super thrilled to see you all at this VSD webinar where we're going to um, tell you a bit about the program, its origins, um, and also uh, take some of your questions at the end. So do stick around to the end. And we definitely want to hear from all of you um, who have been writing into us with your questions and everybody who's um, just joined for this event to hear more about how to apply for the Venture Science Doctorate. Um, but before we get to Q&A, we're going to start with a bit of an overview that I'm going to give. Um, and then Dom and I are going to talk about uh, VSD's origins and what it means to us um, at DSV. Um, you'll hear from Aaron Appleton as well today, um, who is head of program at the VSD. And um, he's going to tell us about the uh, educational approach, uh, the curriculum, and, and some of the thinking that we put into it. Um, but I will kick us off. Uh, so first, I'm Dr. Thane Campbell. I'm Dean at uh, Deep Science Ventures and our education team, um, where we've launched a college and a PhD program that you might have heard of. Um, and yeah, I'm really involved with um, the team and uh, thinking through the earlier phases of VSD and bringing it to um, this, this stage where we're now live. Um, and it's been an incredibly exciting journey for me. And I want to tell you a bit about what it is, um, the Venture Science Doctorate, and why it's been um, such an amazing journey and, and what we've tried to build here. So just briefly, the Venture Science Doctorate, um, it's a three-year PhD program where driven individuals can build science companies to tackle global challenges. We took this position from really thinking about what Deep Science Ventures does and the portfolio of science companies that we've built across deep tech sectors, that's climate, pharmaceuticals, healthcare, agriculture, um, computation. And we've built everything that we've been uh, learning and delivering by creating deep tech companies um, really into this three-year model. And so the VSD uh, allows you to, in three years, have a, a, a venture-focused, outcome-centric program nested in a distributed institution run diversity first. Um, and I just want to step through what each of those means. So this being a venture focused program this means that from the beginning uh even at the application stage even on these webinars we're all thinking about how we might create a science company um, with the research that will be done here and so the whole process is about uh, engaging entrepreneurs becoming one yourself engaging members of the innovation ecosystem um, we're outcome centric so each candidate in this program spends a full year running industrial bottleneck analysis to really understand the sector um, to work backwards from a global challenge and then uh, design your own research project and um, we wanted to enable like full flexibility in that invention pathway and so we've built this into a distributed institution we're working with over 30 university partners and corporate partners um, and what this offers you is the ability to work with the world's most entrepreneurial professors around the world um, and in some of the world's largest research networks. Um, and so that allows you to really be dynamic, to be flexible, to be um, driven by the global need uh, for what you're, what you're building as your technology emerges to be moving into different labs to build the right thing for that global challenge, be it a cure for cancer or be it evading gigatons of CO2. And finally, this is a diversity first program. This is really important to us. It's um, designed from recruitment all the way through to mentorship um, to be a path for, for people of color, for women, um, for people of all kinds of different backgrounds. Uh, and I guess I just wanna spend a little bit more on exactly what this means for us because we do get a lot of questions about um, how we're thinking about diversity and so broadly we see this as like a really critical 
moment um, in the history of the kind of scientific enterprise uh, for diversity and inclusion, both in STEM training and in the workforces that you'll be helping to create by creating your own companies. Um, I guess drawing that to a point, we can see that there are a few statistics, like only 1% of uh, UKRI, so UK funded PhDs in 2018 went to black students. Um, and then, you know, there's statistics that say that only 2.4% of VC is actually going to all women founded uh, deep tech teams. So we see that as a kind of gap that needs to be addressed. And um, it's sort of incumbent on, on everyone who's involved in education today to really take that seriously. Um, and so that's exactly what we've endeavored to do. We're, we're driven to listen to more voices in science and innovation. Uh, one, because yes, it could help us potentially solve the big challenges that we're facing today faster, um, but also because it's just the right thing to do. All of these voices should be heard. And we take both of those uh, responsibilities and, and opportunities like quite seriously and try to hold them together. We would pr promote diversity and inclusion uh, across the program in four key ways, through incentives, recruitment, mentorship, and shared decision-making. So it's, it's really crucial to design programs that appeal across categories. There's been a lot of research to show that um, people from different ethnic groups don't really buy this uh, model of going to sit under the wise professor for X years and do as they're told. Um, and so our incentives are very much around creating your own company, creating that technology uh, and approaching a solution for a global challenge every step of the way. Our recruitment is designed around what we have found to be the key knowledge, traits and attitudes from founders that we've trained through all of DSP's portfolio companies across genders, across ethnic barriers and, and groups and across even different geographies. Um, and so we've really designed recruitment to be something that's um, as unbiased as we could possibly make it, looking at those traits and skills, making it a, a process that shows us the things that people love to do uh, rather than what they look like or what their name sounds like. Um, the mentorship angle of, of how we're uh, bringing inclusion and diversity in is really key and by expanding the network across all of the university partners that we have um, we're really able to bring professors and pis and and research support and mentors from lots of different backgrounds as and when you may need to draw on their expertise and then the shared decision making aspect is really critical to move not just from diversity but to inclusion so we're handing first principles, decision-making protocols to all of the candidates that we work with. You see our criteria for making decisions and you engage with it. And that's how we share decision-making power with you to really see how you would solve these problems um, and, and to learn from, from us as well. So that's like a overall picture of the kind of four big pillars, venture focus, outcome centric, distributed and diversity first for VSD. At this point, um, Dom Falco is going to join the conversation with us. So Dom is uh, the founding director of DSV and has been involved from the beginning, has cared about education uh, throughout the whole journey of creating um, the venture creator that is that is DSV um, and has brought a lot of wisdom and, and really keen insights into how to build this properly um, from day one. So Dom, thanks for um, being here to, to join the webinar. And... Thanks for having me, Zane. I think very few people would refer to me as wise, but um, it's, 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 it's nice, it's nice, it's an aspiration. Um, as Dane said, I'm one of the founders of Deep Science Ventures, um, a little more color on the organization as background. We're just in the process of creating our 40th science-based company. They vary from therapeutics companies to industrial climate tech companies. So they're some of the most difficult companies to build, all focused on solving hard problems. 
before starting Deep Science Ventures, I was working at Imperial College and my job there was focused specifically on supporting early career researchers and engineers to commercialize ideas developed during their studies. So at Imperial, we had uh, an accelerator program, a number of training initiatives. So I ran the kind of entrepreneurial training uh, activities there. And we built companies that were subsequently acquired by Google, Facebook, Apple, Spotify. Um, the pattern that you tend to see is majority of concepts developed out of research in existing universities. They were coming out of single research topics by teams from a single discipline um, with the technology created first and then attempted to commercialize second. And it kind of, it can work quite well in software, but we saw a much higher failure rate in scientific concepts, specifically like impact centric scientific concepts. Um, and we saw this very big opportunity in multidisciplinarity and flipping it. So you start instead with the problem, but doing that inside of university is very difficult. So myself and a colleague left Imperial College to try and start science-based companies outside of university. And in, in terms of why this might make sense, our experience was that universities focus more on intellectual property commercialization than venture creation. So they care more about filing patents and getting royalties from those patents than about spin outs. They saw spin outs as sort of a last resort if they couldn't license the IP. We saw that um, most individuals in the universities were recruited because of their academic acumen rather than their entrepreneurial potential. So we saw the potential to create a space which was concentrated with people who had that level of ambition. We saw that universities were designed more for academic discovery than combinatorial innovations So doing stuff across departments was sometimes very difficult because of differing intellectual property policies across those departments and because of very specific remits given to those academics in terms of the things they had to try and achieve. Papers are more likely to be published in a single academic discipline than in a multidisciplinary context. We saw that universities more, were more focused on salary after you graduate than on the value of the things you create, for example, the value of the company you formed. And they were more concerned with whether or not you graduate than whether or not you spin out. They had organized by discipline rather than problem area. Basically, universities weren't the kind of perfect environment to go if you wanted to solve big problems and specifically if you wanted to solve them with a company. And so we left to create Deep Science Ventures focused on people who already had PhDs are creating that environment for them. And we're now expanding that to create the PhD training program as well. So we're partway through our first cohort at the moment. And so the idea with this PhD program was to see if we could train people for invention rather than discovery. So the question we were asking is, can you use the sort of cutting edge of pedagogy to train the individuals working on the cutting edge rather than the kind of medieval apprenticeship model which is sort of like, as Thane said, training people to follow instructions rather than training people to be independent and inventive thinkers. They're training them to develop new fields entirely rather than to be indoctrinated in existing um, um, fields. And I had the good fortune of meeting Thane when he was doing his PhD at what was supposed to be an industrial program, a program focused on commercialization. And I think this maybe is a good time to kind of hand back to Thane to talk about how that kind of collision happened. Yeah, no. Um, and so I guess just stepping slightly back before that, uh, the context of my own doctoral research is, is where this story began for me. And it was like a highly ambitious um, three university plus GSK plus ST microelectronics project. And the project was aimed at diagnosing like a spectrum of lung diseases with a new device that the group was going to make. Um, so it was incredibly visionary in a way what we we sort of set out to do um but in a lot of ways uh a lot although some amazing things got done which i'm super grateful for still i think um in terms of the experiments that i got to do and and the different um fields that from sort of cell biology to um high throughput imaging to machine learning that we got to fuse in a kind of creative way um we fell into a lot of the same traps of like standard academic research, even with all of this sort of um, energy behind it to really do something different. And so that showed me like firsthand the force of academic culture and that like at the end of the day, if you don't move incentives and you don't move social processes, if those don't change, um, then we're, we're not going to see a different vision emerge from academia. And uh, a different vision is exactly what I encountered in a in a like amazing and stunning way at deep science ventures that has really shaped my career as you can see um but when i went to dsv during my phd um, i encountered a room full of 
people like myself with scientific literacy going after moonshot R&D, going after the creation of science companies that could impact millions and billions of lives in positive ways. And, and that was like nothing I'd ever um, been around before. And it was hugely energizing and uh, inspiring. And so I sort of took from that, that there were really different social processes that we could bring into science, R&D and training. And, um, you know, I also got to see companies like Antiverse being created from those processes, which um, synthesizes antibodies in silico in a day, which is a huge uh, step forward on the 18 month process that took, uh, took place before Antiverse. Um, and so then I was sort of back to the PhD um, with a completely different mindset. That was my Plato's cave moment of seeing that things could genuinely be different from the kind of hallowed halls of academia that have always been the way they've been. Um, and that they might actually be better if they were um, different in, in ways that promoted solving global challenges. And, and so going back to the BHD after that was extremely disorientating and, and um, an interesting thing in its own right. But what it, um, what it gave me is a serious drive and, and sort of urgency to want to invent something myself, having been in a room full of dedicated inventors for a few months. And I, I actually got to do that. Um, I think with that different lens and mindset and having seen hundreds of, of entrepreneurs in different ways during that time, um, I just felt that the confidence and the ability to ask myself the questions that we've been asking in DSV's programs. And um, my own invention was one that I wound up going to GSK to tell the story of. Um, I was invited to their, their headquarters and I spoke to their Stevenage and Philadelphia teams. And that was an incredible moment, as you can imagine, at the end of a PhD. Um, and I, I left with full endorsement written from GSK to see my technology developed. Um, and then I encountered uh, the same barriers that maybe a lot of you already know about um, in technology transfer and, and that Dom alluded to, that it's just not a priority to see new companies spun out. And so we don't have proactive mechanisms for doing that, particularly from the PhD level. We don't have clear mechanisms either. Um, and so that was a huge barrier for my own path. Um, at that point, I learned the hard way that this wasn't going to happen. But there were several around just in my group who had also tried to invent things who, who couldn't. Um, and so with seeing that like GlaxoSmithKline wanted this to happen, but uni didn't, didn't enable it, um, made me think maybe, maybe it should have happened and maybe we need to change that process. And I knew immediately where I could go to spool something out that would change that process. But it took me a couple of years of actually working in that tech transfer office. Um, so I, I moved very much towards them to figure out how things work there. And, and during those years, I surveyed um, and ran project, uh, research projects and, and um, engaged the university in all kinds of ways to to eventually reveal that there are about 8,000 students at that one university, University of Edinburgh, who wanted to also create serious science companies. So the missed opportunity started to seem like a, a citywide thing and not just my lab. Um, I'm, I started working with DSV on this uh, new model um, yes. and, and basically drawing heavily from what DSV has already learned and developed. And uh, one of the first things we did is write a policy proposal with the Federation of American Scientists, which you can check out. It's called Forging 1000 Venture Scientists to Transform the Innovation Economy. And uh, writing that policy proposal was like another moment where I saw um, a lot more to this issue, to this, the problem and the opportunity um, where there were actually at a national level, there was huge urgency to to do things like this. And there were already Nobel laureates like Paul Romer talking about why we need new science training programs and referring to like the Sputnik moment, um, which is this crazy moment in American and Russian history where um, the US responded by actually creating a PhD program 
And that program had some very unique characteristics. It was user-led, it was industrial, it was interdisciplinary, it was portable across universities. Um, so we also drew a lot from historic precedent. And that program, the Title V PhD, created the fields, um, as Dom was alluding to, the fields of electrical engineering, chemical engineering, and the same dynamics actually created the field of computer science. So I realized that this was way bigger than like even what one university should be doing, and that the national opportunity um, fully justified anything that I could be doing in the next few months to try to uh, build this out. And we've had an incredible time um, speaking to different governments, uh, corporates, universities around, and just seeing like the huge um, hunger for new modes of PhD training and new modes of academia at large, like institutions. Um, and, and so it's been an incredible journey and, uh, and I'm glad to be uh, here with you guys to, to eventually take some questions on how you can engage with uh, the Venture Science Doctorate. Um, but before we do that, I appreciate some of you have been putting your hands up. Please do drop questions in the chat. Um, and we're just going to hear a little bit more from Aaron, uh, who's going to tell us about the educational principles of the program. Yeah, well, he has a photo. Thanks, Dane. Yeah, let me pull up a deck here. All right. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Appleton. Uh, I'm the head of the Venture Science Doctorate Program. And I've spent about the last decade burrowing myself deeper and deeper down into a hole um, of a niche called learning experience design and specifically for topics in science and entrepreneurship. So this is essentially the blending of the learning sciences together with principles from interaction design and experience design. Um, and I've, I've uh, previously worked doing learning experience design for a range of companies, um, including a, a startup accelerator in the San Francisco area called OnDeck, um, a startup building a network of modern universities across the African continent um, where we were building a conservation MBA program uh, to get conservation biologists uh, to start companies all across the continent. Um, I've also uh, incubated a company at the Harvard Innovation Labs, also dealing with uh, learning design. Um, and now I'm, I'm very, very excited to, to be heading the VSD program and applying some of these uh, principles and practices from the learning sciences to this very program. So in this section, I'm going to dig very deep into, DS, into VSD's unique approach to learning and some of the various elements of our program. So over these next 10 minutes of the session, uh, it'll flow like this. We're, we're going to start by talking about the big problem from about the past century of traditional masters and PhD programs. And in a nutshell, that's essentially that they've been dominated by an ineffective approach to learning called transmissionism. And then in the second half, we're going to explore some evidence-inspired design processes that we've been using to develop the entire VSD program, which takes a radical break from these transmissionist approaches to learning. So we'll start by first diving into a problem that, again, these programs have, have faced over the last 100 years, and it can be summed up by the single word, transmissionism. So what that is, essentially, it's a concept that comes from the learning sciences, and it's this theory of learning that says knowledge can simply be transmitted top down from an expert and passively absorbed by a learner. You find this occurring in many, many, many forms today, from slide decks, um, unfortunately, like this one, <laughs> to pod courses, to MOOCs, to multiple choice ed tech apps. Um, however, transmissionism is built on this faulty idea about how people learn, and it's been thoroughly discredited in the learning sciences. And yet this transmissionist approach is so pervasive that it's dominated this past century. And I pessimistically refer to this period as the rectangle revolution, because learning is mostly occurring within the confines of a rectangular box. Um, so throughout this timeline, you, you can see here on the screen, I've highlighted some key inflection points where emerging technologies and rapid user adoption of those technologies converge and serve as a platform for both the design and consumption of learning experiences. So you can see at the start, there's a film projector there. 
with a dominant learning design output being recorded lectures. Perfect example of transmissionism. And if we skip ahead, skip ahead, uh, along comes the, the TV and the primary education use case for that ends up being live broadcasts of lectures or educational programming with a bit of a narrative arc thrown on it. Transmissionism again. You can see that here in the mimeograph, in the overhead projector, even fast forwarding into the future, the very exciting Apple II personal computer comes with so much potential to revolutionize learning. However, what ends up happening is that many of the desktop publishing tools are used to create transmissionist artifacts for learners to passively consume, rather than using that powerful tool to turn the learners into the ones doing the creating. Um, same thing you know, happens when the internet goes mainstream, um, when cloud computers come along, and uh, even with you know, the onset here of, of the mass consumer adoption of the iPhone. Again, showing so much potential to revolutionize learning, but most popular learning design outputs have been apps built around a transmissionist approach to learning. Even the Oculus Quest 2, or uh, so somewhat more recently, the distributed autonomous organizations, uh, what ends up happening with the most popular ones is that after a learner is granted tokenized access into a community, the main learning experiences they counter, encounter tend to be live lectures on Zoom. Um, a way to describe what's happening here comes from a former professor at mine uh, at Harvard called Chris Didi, which he calls old wine in new bottles. So the new bottles represent new technologies that are coming along, and the old wine represents the same old ineffective approach to learning, this transmissionism that keeps being perpetuated over and over again as new technologies come along. Um, however, the VSD is working very hard to, to shift this paradigm. We're shifting away from the, these dominant transmissionist models to learning experiences that are built around more evidence. So evidence inspired by the interdisciplinary fields of uh, cognitive science, educational psychology, anthropology, even neurorobotics. And what we're trying to do in this shift also is that you know, learning experiences right now are primarily being designed like drivers are, or like, like the learners are riding a bus. The driver decides where the bus is going, and the passengers are just along for a ride. So the focus is mostly on courses, units, lessons, but the VSD is shifting this. We're creating experiences more like learners are riding a bicycle, where the rider is empowered to choose the destination, the speed, the route and have interaction rich experiences. Here, the focus is much more on designing dynamic learning environments. So just like deep science ventures, the venture science doctorate is also shifting away from like this tech push or a technology first approach uh, to learning design, where a trendy new technology comes out like generative AI, a VR based metaverse, DAOs, whatever it may be, and then learning designers port, copy, digitize, or emulate their content to the new delivery system, which often gets in the way of the learning experience or inhibits meaningful human interaction. So our VSD approach to this is that technologies are delivery systems for experience, and the goals of the learning experience should be given primacy of place. Then a medium can be found to deliver this most effectively. Um, and before we really dig into the details of the VSD program, I think it's important to zoom out just a little more and start from a place that's inspired by evidence of how people learn best. One theory of learning that sits at the heart of the VSD program is it's called constructionism. And it's all about the first part of that word, constructing. And it comes from decades of compounding research from folks like Seymour Papert, uh, John Dewey, uh, Jean Piaget, Lev Vygotsky, and they all point towards the findings generally that, that people learn best through the hands-on process of creating something. And in scientific terms, this construction is uh, providing a link between sensory and abstract knowledge, and it generates understanding through representation. One of my favorite quotes that helps to distinguish the difference between this dominant transmissionist approach and constructionism is uh, found at the bottom of the screen there from the late Seymour Papert, where he says, better learning will not come from finding better ways for an expert to instruct, 
but from giving the learner better opportunities to construct. So once this foundation of learning through making has been established, we then validate our learning experience against second order principles of learning, kind of like you see on the screen here, um, like ecological validity uh, is recursive feedback uh, implemented into the program. Are there opportunities for embodied cognition and, and so forth? Uh, so we can ensure the learning is most effective. Now, what that is looking like in our first term, you can see a sampling of the five courses our students are just about to finish right now. Um, so they take these um, all in parallel with one another. It goes uh, from September up through December 15th. And you can see there's a variety of different dimensions in you know, training a, a learner to be an effective venture scientist from complex decision making, where we've worked with some world leading experts in cognitive task analysis, um, to create a curriculum for our students where they will identify an area that they would like to get better at that is essential to succeeding as a venture scientist. And then they will go and interview experts using a very rigorous uh, structured interview process. Distill all of their findings into a book that we then publish and uh, share with the greater deep science ventures and deep tech community. We also have a course on Stochastic Studio, which is all about this, this thing called Hudagaji or self-directed learning. So each student is given $1,000 and you must direct your own learning. You're creating your own program over the coming three months um, where you have to identify what is an area of growth that will most benefit me as a venture scientist. And then you go full force in creating your own project, presenting that every two weeks to the community, getting feedback and continually pushing yourself to the edge of your abilities. Um, Next, we have venture science finance. So really digging into um, what does it mean to be a capital allocator in the deep tech space? So we look at you know, multiple sources of funding from dilutive to non-dilutive sources of funding and really try to put ourselves in the shoes of a deep tech capital allocator um, as we go through and analyze different companies um, and see what it might be like to sit on the other side of the seat uh, as say like a deep tech investor. Um, and then at the very heart of the curriculum is our scoping course. Um, so we've got two that are paired together, intro to scoping and secondary research that supports your scoping. So this is all about, you, you know, the venture science doctorate and deep science ventures core approach to innovation for creating these specific types of science companies. So you're led through um, all this very, very rigorous process of, you know, starting with an outcome and then narrowing down until you find a list of potential technologies that may be best suited to achieving that. How it's structured is that um, we've got, you know, a mix of async and synchronous learning experiences. And then uh, also it's it's a bit of a hybrid approach too. So we've got, um, you know, a lot of virtual learning, but then culminating at the very end of each term with an in-person experience. So you can see our uh, five courses. These two are combined at the top here that students are going through this term. And they meet at this cadence of every course meets once every two weeks. And what happens in that session is in the first half, since it's all you know, project-based, it's all constructionist, um, the first half of each session, students are presenting the project work they've done for the prior two weeks. And there are members of the Deep Science Ventures community present. Um, your peers are there. We always invite uh, external visiting experts um, and so you get multiple sources of feedback from all these people that are listening to your presentation, um, which will help you to continually improve throughout the term. Um, and then the second half of each session, we have an interactive exercise that serves the purpose of essentially introducing you to what your next two weeks of project work will look like. Um, some of the time it's playful, some of the time it's a game, but it's always going to be interactive and highly social um, with the other peers going through the cohort with you as you get introduced to say um you know how to do a top-down tam analysis in venture science finance so that's the basic cadence and then at the very end of the program or the term um, we bring all of our uh, vsd students to a certain location each time, a different location uh, that has a high concentration of deep tech entrepreneurs and funders. And then we involve them and the deep science community, uh, ventures community together um, in basically a celebration and a showcasing of all this project work that you've done throughout the, the, the past term. Um, 
And to show you like a, a more in-depth view of what some of these uh, interactive exercises look like, um, this is one that we typically use. It's, it's uh, um, done on Miro, um, and it's always done in usually groups of two, three, or four. For this one, um, students are partway through their scoping process, and you're broken up into teams. Each team is given a certain outcome they want to achieve. I think this one had to uh, do something with food scarcity in a certain country. Um, and then they go through all of these lenses here of thinking differently about how they want to achieve that outcome. And then they arrive at a very different approach from one another. Um, and this is just kind of a, a kickoff to like what these scoping moves or scoping lenses can be that you'll be working on then for the next two weeks to continually refine your scoping work. Um, another one I can showcase quickly before I get to the end is this is for our complex decision making course. Again, um, this uses a cognitive task analysis process. So in this particular one, they're partway through and they're learning how to conduct an interview type called a knowledge audit interview. So this is where you interview a, a deep tech entrepreneur um, who is an expert in a particular area you are interested in. And the whole goal of it is to try and understand their tacit knowledge or basically hidden knowledge that you know isn't publicly available somewhere. And they go through kind of a, a, a simulation here where they're uh, practicing different roles. One person is the interviewer, one is the interviewee, and you go back and forth um, to give you some practice of how to do this interview type as you get ready to conduct that in the coming two weeks. All right, and to wrap up, um, the the last bit here is the feedback again we try and make this highly interactive and engaging with the greater community this is one activity we do called feedback lenses where after a student presentation is given that student themselves selects the type of feedback they want to receive and then everyone present in the session selects the type of feedback they want to then give um, and then you just kind of go through this uh, activity where you can give that type of feedback and then lastly uh, he, here is our intensive. Um, it's coming up next week, actually, where we bring everyone to London um, and we are going all over the place. So we'll be out in Bristol at a place called Science Creates. Um, we'll be meeting with some of their staff, uh, some of their founders and some of the uh, venture capital investors um, and then engaging in a term sheet negotiation simulation with them that you can see pictured here. Um, we're also going to be renting a whole venue called uh, the, the London Night Cafe, where students will be exhibiting their stochastic studio work and the greater deep science ventures community will be coming through and engaging with it and providing feedback on it. On Wednesday, we'll be doing a book launch. You can see pictured up here in the top. Um, it's called an Atlas of Venture Science. So each student gets a chapter and this is the, the results of their um, complex decision-making interviews with different deep tech entrepreneurs. So this is a, a living document. We're gonna continually publish it every year a cohort goes through and each student will that goes through our program will add on a chapter that will go on to benefit venture science doctorate students, uh, deep science ventures founders, and hopefully the greater, um, the, the greater deep tech community. All right, and I am going to hand it back to Thane. Thank you very much. Aaron, thanks so much for that deep dive into how everything works inside the program. Guys, I hope that's been a useful overview and, and sort of dash through um, what, what you can see is a really engaged process of building a venture step by step um, and organizing your PhD research around that. Uh, we do have a flood of questions, which is really exciting. Uh, I don't know that we'll get to all of them, but we will try, guys. Um, I'll I'll kick us off and take a few questions on the application process. So um, there's a question about the habits, um, mindsets, and skills that we're looking for when people apply. Um, and so we measure magnetism, determination, and expertise. And each of those are categories that decompose into another three um, subcategories. And, and so across that, we have very clear things that we're looking for. For example, in expertise, we're not just looking for technical knowledge, uh, the kind of standard science background, but also commercial knowledge and first principles problem solving. Um, and so there's actually more detail on this um, on another one of our uh, 
webinars you can check out um, unveiling the venture science doctorate on um, YouTube. There's another question uh, around. Sorry, I'm just like spooling through these thousand questions here. It's really exciting. Um, yeah, if we've if someone's already started a, a venture, would it be possible to incorporate the first or in the first or second year, depending on the process? So actually, a few people have asked me this um, in in LinkedIn and stuff as well, people who are approaching. Um, and so we've got a really structured approach to making sure that you're designing something that's outcome centric. So uh, you on the program will spend your three years tackling a global challenge. And um, if your company happens to be the best way from first principles to tackle that challenge, then you can spend the first year learning everything Aaron's been talking about in terms of scoping. And that process will like reveal that, that your company is the right one to um, keep working on. But we are asking people to keep an open mind um, in that they might find through a year of digging into the space that there's an even better way to cure cancer or um, like 100x the compute power of our of our semiconductors today. And so if you find that, we would hope that that would be enough to compel you to want to work on another company. If you absolutely refuse to work on anything except what you're currently working on, um, that might be that might be a barrier. So we are asking people really to commit to the scoping ontology that we've spent a lot of time delving into, and we we trust very heavily. Um, and it, by all means, like ping another follow up question if if any of that's unclear. I'll probably take. Um, well, Dom or Aaron, did you see any questions that you wanted to take? Maybe it's worth Aaron just talking a little bit about how um, scoping topics are selected and whether or not you need to have an idea coming into the program, because I think there are a lot of questions on this. And then we can segue from that to talk about how once topics have been decided and developed, how the matching process works with professors and partners. And then maybe we could talk about the partners that we have after that as a kind of flow. Does that make sense? It covers a lot of the questions, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a great question. Uh, so. Yeah, you, you can come into the program without having a clear technology that you want to be developing. It's encouraged. Um, however, what we tend to look for is people that already have a STEM background. Usually, um, like many of our candidates in the, the first cohort tend to have a master's degree in a STEM area and one that's relevant to the four sectors that uh, DSV works in. So again, those are agriculture, environment, um, computation, and uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, so if you generally have expertise in any one of those four areas, you would be a good fit for the program. When we go through the scoping process, we start very, very, very broad. Just what does like the whole sector look like? What are some you know p potential um, outcomes that I might want to achieve, say, in environment. Maybe that's a direct air capture company. Maybe it's a new energy technology. Um, it could be any number of things within that sector. But then our scoping process and through the mentorship of many Deep Science Ventures staff and founders, um, you will be guided through this process and start to narrow in and develop um, expertise around a particular problem that you really, really want to invest your time for the rest of the program to dig into. Absolutely. And um, as a part of that scoping process, it's really a, a social process as well as a first principles way of digesting out um, all the, the different approaches to solve your moonshot. Um, and the social aspect is that you're not just at a laptop or in a library uh, doing sort of research in that way. You are building scientific research, but also market research findings. Uh, logging those in to an outcomes graph. So again, we've got a, a video on our YouTube channel of building outcomes graphs. Check that out and there's more detail on that um, there. And there are a couple of articles on our website as well about the outcomes graph. Um, but as you're doing that, you're actually going and having conversations with deep tech founders in your space, um, academics that you could be working with or learning from, policymakers, right? 
understanding in, in great detail from many angles of the innovation ecosystem exactly what the barriers, the constraints, the requirements are to run a technology through the real world up to the solution that you're trying to um, create. And so the way that we facilitate that is by connecting you across our network really dynamically. Um, and so you can be chatting to us as you're scoping to sort of ping, ping one of us and say, is there anybody who's looking at um, the nitrification of rivers that happens when fertilizers spill off and what happens in the real world around that? And um, that could be something that you want to delve into from an academic perspective, and we'd connect you to PIs and professors. It could be something that you want to understand from a commercial aspect, and we've got lots of great commercial partners that we're working on there uh, as well. So at any point, DSV's network is um, something that you can be delving into to advance your scoping, and we will help you to find the right people um, that we already know and that we've already built into VSD. So that means that you're building quite a complex project that's that will eventually be fit for the real world. Um, and there are a number of partners that really want to help you do that already. Uh, and so I won't list all of them because there's over 30, um, but we are working with Imperial College London, uh, King's College London, the University of Edinburgh. Um, we're working with top universities as well in the US, so the Mayo Clinic, Cornell University, and like a lot of different partners now on, on six continents. Um, and so that's a broad space for you to be one running questions through as and when, um, but also in years two and three, when you would have hopefully completed that scoping and you're ready to build a technology in these different labs, you won't be bottlenecked in the same way that a lot of labs are or people doing research are today, where they really sit very much in one lab, in one department, which usually is built around one discipline. Um, and, and that's the expertise they can access. We mean for you to be able to move um, and as the technology is emerging into a different space, um, robotics meets synthetic biology, you go to a synth bio lab and you actually build that out. So we're just flicking through questions here. Um, there's one here. How do you feel about applicants who have been away from the lab for a while? I'm now an R&D policy expert rather than a sector expert. Is that welcome? Yeah, so I mean, as I touched on very quickly just there, policy can be a big aspect um, of, of some of these things. So I'm at, uh, I'm at COP28 right now, guys. I, I stepped away from that because I, I want to talk to you about the VSD and take your questions. Um, but the, the whole climate change angle is one where we see huge political commitments and will and, and political processes that need updating. And we're excited about entrepreneurship as a way to reveal things that can be done faster. Um, technology that can move us forward faster and also like processes that get um, built into your business model that might be scalable. Um, and so there's some great examples of that. You can check out like Deep Sky who are in Canada um, and, and the findings that you encounter in the policy space, we would want you to distill that as you're going. It'll be built into your outcomes graph. And it'll be very easy for you to sort of draw out everything related to policy. Um, and we'll actively be having conversations with the governments that we're working with. Um, and so your specific point as well about uh, do you need to be recently attached to R and like a, a, a university lab? No. Um, if you have broader experience, bring it to the VSD. And, and certainly in some sectors, it'll help you build a company faster. We got 10 more minutes I'm looking for questions that looked particularly burning in the text box. Um, there's a question about engaging, a few questions about engaging with accelerators and whether 
having done that before if that's a problem uh no and i imagine it would only be a, in a lot of instances that would have that would have helped you develop some of the skills and, and attitudes that we're looking for um i guess if you're thinking about bringing a specific technology that's like partly owned by um other people then that would be something that we'd have to think in more detail with you about and again the, the first kind of point around committing to scoping to build the absolute best thing that you can in the three years that you have um, would, would be relevant there as well. Aaron, there's a question um, that, that I wanna flick to you. My question is, is an entrepreneurial finance background required? Um, no, it's not, but would be very beneficial, especially in our venture science finance course, um, where we take on the perspective of capital allocators, um, which is incredibly important in helping you prepare um, to make essentially a, a venture investable company. Yeah, great. So, I mean, a lot of the skills that you will need um, across VC, across um, prototyping and business model design, you will actually be able to gain on the program. Um, of course, if you already bring strength in the space, that'll help your application. I can take the IP question if you want. Go for it. So, all intellectual property generated during your PhD will be assigned into the company you form and you will be the majority owner of that company. But during the program, we will temporarily hold the IP. That is to make it easier for us to negotiate intellectual property rights with each of the universities you're potentially placed with. Because in order to partner with universities, we have to sign MOUs dedicating how intellectual property will be divvied up ahead of time. It makes it easier for us to just secure all of those generate the IP and then assign it into the company. And be clear that assigning means that the company will fully own the IP, it's not a license from us. It's put into the company and the company will own it completely. I can jump in for one here. Um, Krishanthan asks, do you need a master's degree to apply for this program? Um, I have mentioned that candidates have expertise in one domain with their master's degree. Um, so that's what our candidates now have but it is not a requirement um relating back to a uh, aspect of my presentation um i mean we really believe strongly that self-directed learning is one of the most powerful ways to learn something so if you can showcase through the application process that you have say master's level degree knowledge in a scientific domain that's you know relevant to the vsd program um that uh, that will suffice can take the um, equity ownership question as well while I'm on the commercial ones. Um, so the venture science doctorate will hold a 10% stake in companies formed, but it's a not-for-profit stake, which means that all proceeds from our ownership in companies started by VST candidates will be reinvested to create new fellowships in the future. So because the program is fully funded, we pay the stipend, we pay research costs, we pay um, visiting student status, consumables, etc. There's a significant cost for running the program and in order to get funding we have to show sustainability over the long term and our sustainability mechanism is starting companies and then taking a small ordinary stake so 10 percent in ordinary shares so it's fully dilutable so any additional investment will dilute us alongside you guys we're all aligned in terms of share classes and then any proceeds should the company be acquired uh, that come back to us we will put into a dedicated pot to create new fellowships for future students so you're kind of paying it forward in a sense through that mechanism And give us a broad strokes of the application process so um from now until december 23rd the first window of applications is open as you might have seen on the website um so you will submit like a cv and your like a personal statement in the summary something that describes basically how you how you come up to the entry requirements that we're asking people to consider as they apply and then uh, you'll, you're essentially held uh, and there'll be key points throughout the cycle um, where we 
open a, a one week window for you to complete a case study. And so this is where we get to, before I mentioned that we, we assess magnetism, expertise, and determination. And we're really looking at um, expertise and a little bit of your determination in that case study. It's designed to be completed in your own time over the span of a normal nine to five working week. So it's not that it'll take you an entire week to do it. Um, and you will, as a part of doing that case study, you'll get a lot of instruction from our um, videos that we've recorded in the past, articles that we have of exactly how to think the way that DSV does about designing ventures um, and and how to build really strong um, narratives and advantages uh, into the venture that you're coming up with, which a lot of people find helpful whether or not they join the program. Like it's a system that you can think through and people use our scoping ontology for venture design, but people use it in the policy space. It's, it's a broad tool for coming up with solutions to big problems. So um, just by applying and making it through to the next round of applications, you will see um, how we do that breaking down complex spaces into specific research projects and, and approaches that could solve them. Um, so you'll get all of that from round two. And then there's a final round where uh, you come to interview. So there's a question here from Diane on talking a bit about the interview process as well. So we can't assess everything um, on paper, even with this uh, case study that, that I've been telling you about. Um, and so at interview, we have a conversation with you. Um, it's not meant to, it's sort of a relaxed environment where we want to understand how you communicate um, and, and some of the things that are driving you and how you've worked in different environments. And that helps us to kind of understand uh, beyond the research and commercial knowledge that you might have um, and, and beyond how you organize it, the magnetism aspect of, of um, your concise storytelling, your persuasion, your empathy, and how you bring those things um, to VSD as well. So I hope that's uh, given you more depth around exactly what happens at the different stages. And so the first cycle, as I mentioned, closes um, December 23rd, and we'll have another window that opens um, next year and closes on March 2nd. I think that's all we, we have finish, time for. Oh. We just get Aaron to answer the technical science question, the one on technical learning, just before we finish, because yeah. I think it's a really important question. I don't want anyone to leave thinking that you're just going to learn. Go on, Aaron. Yeah, yeah, I saw that one. That's a great one. Um, so Anurag asks, is there an opportunity for dedicated course-based technical learning? It seems like the curriculum is mostly focused on the venture aspect. What about the science itself? Really, really good question. Um, in the whole first year, you're kind of developing this entrepreneurial foundation as a venture scientist, but I would say roughly 20% of that is more like technical and scientific. One example to share there is our Stochastic Studio course, um, where you design your own uh, self-directed learning path. One student in there is combining machine learning together with immunology. Another student is digging deep into synthetic biology and using it to figure out how to make trees grow faster for urban architecture. So one example of some technical learning that's interwoven in, but then by the time you get to year two and three, it is very, very scientific. You are in a lab, you know, working under the supervision of a PI, you know, with um, some other uh, PhDs and postdocs. Um, so yeah, year two and three, uh, very, very technical. Sure. I mean, uh, so two out of the three years you're doing PhD level research, that first year is just making sure you you aim it at something that that really matters for for society at large. Um, guys, thank you so much for jumping on and, and for so many of you staying on till the end. Uh, we hope this has been helpful for you making a decision about whether or not to apply. Um, we've had a great time telling you about uh, how Venture Science Doctorate works. And thanks as well to everyone who's asked questions and, and put in really nice comments actually in here as well about how how inspiring you're finding our, our systems approach. Um, thank you for, for joining us. And that brings this webinar to a close, guys. So, so please apply and we'll see you in the next round of applications, hopefully.